Hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. Our guest today is Rebecca Contreras. She is the president and CEO of Avant Garde LLC. It's an SBA certified 8A and woman-owned small business. It's a firm she co-founded as majority partner in May 2011. And the firm offers what they describe as a one-stop shop approach to addressing complex organizational people and technology needs. Um, Rebecca is also author of the book titled Lost Girl, From the Hood to the White House to Millionaire Entrepreneur. This book recounts her journey from starting as a, a welfare-dependent teenage mother to advising a sitting president to now driving a successful 100-person company. So Rebecca, first off, uh, before I tell you a little bit more about her, uh, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good to have you. And it's great to be here with a fellow Texan, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just you're, you're down I-35 uh, from, <laughs> from where, where I am. And I'm really excited to you know hear your stories and talk about different things that you've done. But let me tell the audience first just a little bit more detail um, about Rebecca's work. So she's a social and business entrepreneur. Um, she started her 15 years in service in government in a welfare to work program uh, for the Texas governor, uh, the icon, Ann Richards. Rebecca then spent nearly 12 years working with George W. Bush, first in Texas as his director of HR, and then in the White House as a commissioned officer supporting the presidential transition, followed by other roles in DC. So for those who are just listening to the podcast, you don't see the visual of uh, a presidential seal <laughs> behind you and a, a Wonder Woman statue. So we, <laughs> Those were we, both uh, gifts, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> both very meaningful to you, I'm sure, in different ways. You've you've probably been described as Wonder Woman along the way. <laughs> My kids call me Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's so much we could talk about between your career and your book and your business. But as, as we always do here, Rebecca, you know, looking back at, at your work and, and your career, what would you say is your favorite mistake? Well, gosh, um, if you read Lost Girl, they're layered into about four different chapters and there's a, lo a laundry list of mistakes. But, you know, Mark, I'm the fail forward kind of gal and mm -hmm. have over the course of my career learned how to take my past issues and mistakes um, that I, you know, can't go back and change and uh, try to figure out, a, you know, a way to do some benefit from it. So my, I have to say, I've thought a lot about this and my biggest mistake has to be, you um, just, you know, making some really poor choices as a young adult, Mark, uh, I would say teen young adult. Um, when I actually was asked to join the presidential team in the White House, I actually came from Texas with Governor Bush, and then he was elected and, of course, went to serve. You've got to go through an extensive background check. And given that my level was commission officer level, I needed to get a top secret clearance. And my meetings in the Oval Office, um, you know, were significant. And, you know, you, anytime you're around the president, you've got I kind of pass pass that test, and mm -hmm. I, I I really thought a lot about going through that process and 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 answering all the twenty eight pages of Secret mm -hmm. Service questions and FBI questions, and really kind of put a, a a stake in the ground and being really truthful and transparent about my background. Mark, I will tell you, I learned later a lot of people don't do that, and. Um, they aren't very forthright and leading in what I call a, a, a raw transparency. And I, I decided to, to do that and, and put a lot of my issues and mistakes in there for my young teen and young adult life. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that uh, it was one of those crapshoots, Mark, that I thought, gosh, you know, <laughs> am I really going to pass muster and keep in mind for the, for your listeners and viewers uh, you know, I was in the White House seeing people escorted out that didn't make clearance all day long. Mm. And so it, it's wow. a pretty serious undertaking when you have to go through a TS level clearance working for pre the president in the White House. And but I decided to put myself out there and um, and my my mistakes um, are riddled uh, early on. And, and there's a lot of big ones. But I would say the biggest one I think I made that I. I regret, well, really two, one of them was dropping out of high school. Um, I ended up becoming a teen mom and the whole story is recounted in Lost Girl, but, um, and I was really a lost girl, <laughs> but, you know, I dropped out of high school and it was out of shame and out of embarrassment and out of just a lack of self-love and self-focus. Um, and it was, it was a big mistake that I, that I have come to regret. I actually ended up going back to school and tell that whole story, but 
you know, when, when you're 17, 18, 19 years old, Mark, you don't stop and think about how those decisions are going to follow you and, and basically the rest of your life. And uh, like I said, when I had to make my clearance, there were a lot of mistakes that I led with and transparency, and they're all noted in the book. But I would say dropping out of school um, and not really thinking through the implications of what that was going to be uh, was probably my biggest one. Yeah. And that, I mean, uh, making decisions for uh, with a long term perspective is something that teenagers, young adults, generally speaking, struggle with. I mean, you know, that that's um, sort of comes with the territory of, of not maturing or even they say our brains haven't fully developed yet. But um, yeah, how, how did you get yourself back on track? I'd be curious to hear more about, you know, first off, going back to school and, and getting yourself on a different path. Yeah, I, I actually, at age 19, as a single mom, my, my mother was raising my daughter because she had taken her away from me and, you know, had had an aha moment, had an epiphany, if, if you would call it, of, you know, I've got to get my my crap together and <laughs> figure out, you know, I've got a little one here who's almost a year old and doesn't really have a mother who's functional, right? So I grew up in a very dysfunctional home, Mark. My, my mom was a heroin addict and mm. was on the streets and we didn't have fathers. And so I grew up in a, a toxic environment as a child and a teenager, but I had to make a decision at 19 for myself. I've got to do things different and change the trajectory of my life. And so I ended up going back to school and enrolling in a welfare to work program. I recount the whole story in the book. And that's how I landed that job with Ann Richards. Um, I threw a welfare to work program. Uh, she took me in and um, her staff took me in and she was the tr state treasurer at the time running for governor. And I was actually her receptionist, but, uh -huh. but it was it, mentors. It was leadership. It was believing in myself. It was faith. It was all those things that the require, you know, you taking the bull by the horns with your journey and really changing your life for the positive. Yeah. I mean, thinking to some of the things you do now, I mean, I'm sure you, you work to encourage um, other girls, young women to, to dream of becoming an entrepreneur or, or dream of serving, you know, at the highest levels of government. Um, I imagine that perspective um, must allow you to um, provide inspiration or mentoring to, to, to girls today? Absolutely. One of my, one of my core DNA in, in my blood is leadership and mentoring. My husband and I have done a lot of work with inner city kids here in Austin through our nonprofit. Um, and we've served, you know, the little Rebecca's of the world and in his case, the little David's cause he grew up in a similar type environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, giving back and paying it forward, Mark, I've had a tremendous amount of success because I'm a product of the relationships in my life, the mentors and the people that were smarter than me that actually saw my potential when I didn't see it in myself, but I also worked really hard. Um, and just being able to take, um, you know, young women, I'm mentoring two young women right now. Well, I would say young women, they're younger than me. I'm in my fifties. They're, they're both in business. They're trying to get their business off the ground. And one of them's a single mom and, you know, just really investing in, 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 in women and in girls, um, over the years, it's been part of my DNA. And when, when people that know me, uh, know my plight, that's one of the top things that, that, that I focus on because somebody did it for me. And therefore, I'm going to pay it forward and do it for someone else. Uh, that's great. And, and, and back to your story and, and the development of, of your career, you know, it sounds like there were some opportunities through a program. And I'm sure Ann Richards personally and, and George W. Bush personally, I'd, I'd be curious to hear their reactions or, or maybe especially President Bush's when you were talking about security clearance and being forthcoming and disclosing um you know stories and 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 mistakes you had made um you, you ended up with that job so it seems like it worked out for the best but I'd, I'd be curious to hear some more of the detail of of how they reacted to that honesty yeah well there's a whole chapter in the book with the intimate details of that process and um I'll tell you um, just quickly I recently got a letter two weeks ago from President Bush it was actually handwritten and just so endearing. And Mark, the fact that he would, I didn't send him a book. He, he got it from someone. Um, the fact that he would take time to read it and then take time to write me a personal note, his, he led with, uh, I, I, I knew you had been through some stuff, but I didn't realize the depth of your, of your pain or the depth of the challenges that you overcame and how much prouder he was of me knowing the full story. Um, you know, presidents don't know all the details of their staff. They're, they're not mm -hmm. supposed to do that. There's the, 
the person doing the clearance approvals is the one that knows. And Mm -hmm. he and I had worked together in Texas together. um, And his deputy is the one that called me in and said, Hey, you know, we just got this, uh, this from the secret service. And we realize you have a shady past here, but you know, the people that are involved in your life over the last two decades know you and, you know, they speak for your character. So we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to overlook the, the preteen, you know, young adult, you know, wayward Mm -hmm. uh, black sheep, whatever you call it. I Mm -hmm. I will tell a funny story that um, is kind of nice, kind of, kind of funny. Uh When I made clearance um, and obviously my reputation had, had spoken for itself or the, over Mm -hmm. the last two decades. Right. So um, again, working hard and, and showing myself to be faithful in terms of my credibility, and trustworthiness. Um, I walked into the Oval about three weeks after I made clearance and um, uh, President Bush uh, kind of winked at me and said something to the effect that, you know, I I, I know you're black, you're, you have some black sheep history too, or something like that. Because, uh, you know, he's always <laughs> joked as kind of being the little yeah. black sheep in the Bush family. Right. But, right. Um, but I really, and he didn't, he doesn't, he didn't, now he knows that he's read the book, right? But mm-hmm. He didn't know at that time the depths of my background or or even my pain, Mark, or my abandonment and all the abuse I sustained along with all the bad mistakes I made. But I just find the fact that he is such a tremendous leader to take the time to care. Um, I think that in the 12 years I spent with Bush, um, I found he really cared about his people and cared about the individual, not just what they brought to the table in terms of the skill set, but he really cared about the individual. Yeah, that's great. And you know, it's great to hear um, that there's, you know, I mean, you, you would hate to see a mistake from youth completely derail somebody's life without hope for redemption or, or getting back on track. It's, it's, it's one thing if, you know, somebody makes a mistake and then ends up in an unsupportive, dysfunctional environment. It sounds like, thankfully, you had enough stability to get, to get things on track. For yeah. I, I got my life on track at age 19. Um, I, you know, I got off drugs and got, uh, got back to school, married my husband at 21. And we started doing a lot of inner city outreach to the gangs and, and kids in schools that were kind of anti-drug anti uh, the whole story is in the book, but you know, mm-hmm. I, I did put that stake in the ground. I, th- I think even as adults though, Mark, when we make mistakes, cause I could tell you about some whoppers as an adult, not not those kinds of mistakes, but other mistakes, picking the wrong, wrong partner or going into business with the wrong person or, you know, you know, hiring the wrong person, all sorts of mistakes that we have to own. We, we still have to look at a way to, to fail, fail forward and look at that situation. Mm-hmm. It, it's there's a great book by John Maxwell called Fail Forward that I love. Yeah. And it's really owning that failure to say, you know, I own this failure and I am going to figure out a way to find something good, some nugget in there that I can learn from to make me better. Better. So uh, mm-hmm. that that's been my approach, my whole journey. And you, you'd made reference to you know when when Governor Bush was transitioning into becoming President Bush that that he asked you to come work with him, and you you used the phrase imposter syndrome. How did you? I mean, how how did you come to recognize that? How how did you get past that? It's it's a common thing, so I wouldn't call that a mistake, but it yeah. is something a lot of people we all deal with on some level. Yeah, well, you know, when you have my background, I, I don't have a traditional four-year college degree. I, I I went the the alternative route and got a lot of training and education, what I call professional development. Mm-hmm. But really, um, my career accelerated with people that believed in me, that gave me a chance. Uh, and then I worked really hard, and I knocked it out of the park, and I did my part right. Um, but you know, for me, early on, Mark, and especially I have in the book a really neat Oval Office story of my first experience in the Oval. I had known Governor Bush, but I hadn't seen him yet as president. And I talk about that first experience, just being overwhelmed. For me, it's all about overcoming my insecurities um, and realizing that you know I need to own my the love of myself and also understand that. You know, I may not have the credentials that everybody else has, but I were, I'm a hard worker, I'm trustworthy, and I really have that track record of results and outcomes and excellence and, you know, building a track record. And so early on, I would say the first two to three years of my White House um, and my DC experiences were really tough. And anytime I felt like I didn't belong or I felt like I was going to be overcome because, you know, I was in the presence of somebody much more qualified than I was. 
I had to like psych myself up and get myself, you know, lots of positive energy and thinking and prayer or whatever it takes for you to get into that mode. Right. Yeah. And, and also go to those people that do believe in you to say, Hey, I'm struggling right now. Like, can you help me? And allowing them to really be your support system. Again, I'm a product of the people in my life. And I think uh, early on in my life, I was a product of negative toxic people. And later on in my life, I became a product of good people that really supported me. And so I'm a big advocate of that. That's really powerful. And you, your team shared a couple of photos that I think I'm able to put into um, the show notes of uh, a photo of, of you and President, a couple photos of you in the Oval Office with President Bush working uh, with him. And I mean, I see, I recognize Chief of Staff uh, Andy Card is there, um, the, the, the recently departed uh, General Colin Powell. Yeah, I mean, wonderful it's, it's people, from, uh, by the way, just wonderful people. Yeah. I mean, so what I, uh, what what is it like? I mean, I'm trying to think exactly how to ask this. Like, it's hard to imagine being. I've been in the replica Oval Office at the George <laughs> Bush Presidential Library. Yeah, it's hard to imagine being being there with with um, you know such accomplished, powerful um, people. Um, how, I, I'm, I'm just, this is a very open-ended question. I mean, I, I, I'd just be curious to hear if you have any reflections or a story about, about them. Oh, absolutely. Listen, I, I would pinch myself, Mark. Uh, I remember my first walk down the Rose Garden. I had full access to the West Wing and the White House, and I had what we call a dark blue badge, which gives you commission officers full access to pretty much Rome. Mm -hmm. The only place you can't go is the private residence, but anywhere else you can go and take people to. And I remember walking through the Rose Garden, pinching myself, and that famous red carpet that you see Kennedy, President Kennedy walking mm -hmm. down in that famous picture, and just in awe that I was there. And so for me, Mark, it was about taking in every moment and realizing what a blessing and how rare that opportunity was and never really taking it for granted. Um, and, you know, being able to really experience that was really powerful. I'll tell you that that picture um, that you have in your footnotes, I'll tell you that story. Um, so we were, this was a, a couple of weeks after 911. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we did not think we were going to see the president ever again, because mm -hmm. Uh, we were meeting with him about once a week at that point on personnel, which is what I did. Yeah. And uh, that particular day was the Easter egg roll day. And Mark, my children were on the lawn doing the Easter egg roll with my husband when I was in that Oval Office. And um, we had he had uh, called us in for a personnel meeting and Andy and, and Colin Powell were still having a dialogue. And the protocols in the pre in the White House is you wait at the door till you're summoned in by the president when you have a formal meeting. You just don't go and see the president. It's a very formal thing. Sure. And I was standing at the door with my portfolio waiting with my boss, Clay Johnson, who's been one of my biggest champions and mentors. And I talk about him in the book. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I hear, Becca, get in here, which is what he used to call me, Becca. Yeah. And, you know, I walked into this conversation that he and uh, Andy Card and Colin Powell were having. And I just, if you look at the, my eyes in that picture, I'm literally going, I can't believe I'm standing <laughs> here listening. I could not believe I was in that conversation and listen to them talking about the whole, you know, the whole plan and just, we you know, post 911. And, and then, you know, probably five minutes later, they leave and then we started our meeting. But it was just, it's just one of those sort of wow. catalyst moments, Mark, where you just really stop and just think, what an incredible opportunity to be here for such a time as this. Um, I'm, I'm a woman of faith and I believe everything is timed perfectly. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. it, you know, I have so many stories, all of which I depict in the book. Well, not all of them, but my biggest ones are in there. So I encourage your readers to get it. But just an incredible, incredible service opportunity for me and my family. Yeah. And in that photo, I can't tell there's somebody whose back is completely to the camera. Who, who That's my that? boss, Clay Johnson. That's Clay. Yeah, okay. So he's Clay. Yeah. And he's actually in the book as well. And lots mm -hmm. of pictures of him, but he's the one that, that actually would take the personnel team in to meet with President Bush. So he's President Bush's best friend from Yale and Andover and mm -hmm. um, was the assistant to the president mm -hmm. for personnel, which was my direct manager. Yeah. You, you mentioned protocol. I would be terrified of uh, some sort of misstep that breaches protocol or etiquette, or I guess there are some breaches that might get you tackled by the secret service yeah. versus yeah. things that are well, just. I, I kind of had a couple of faux pas uh, in my 
white wing, West wing, uh, you know, walks that I used to take. And, um, you know, you just learn, you learn as you go. And, you know, I always say, you know, you can always say you're sorry and ask for forgiveness <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, but I did yeah. get it down within, I would say six months, I was a master at protocols, uh, which was yeah. helpful. Yeah. And, and, and one other question you, you referenced after 9-11, were, were you just afraid security was going to be tightened up? So even though you were in kind of, you know, inner circles, did, were you, you said you're afraid you wouldn't see him again, just that access and security would be well, no, even um, tighter, so we, and I tell the whole 911 story in my book, there's a whole chapter on 911. But I was we were concerned because we were personnel. Mm -hmm. And he was dealing with the world and, you know, yeah. the war and everything else. And so we thought, well, you know, personnel is probably going to take a backseat uh, to all okay. this other stuff. And but you know what's amazing, Mark, about President Bush and Governor Bush and then President Bush, in my experience, um, when we work with him in Texas and in D.C., is he cares deeply about the people he hired. And to him, it was number one, because the people that he hired to represent him, bear in mind, there are 4,000 appointments the president can make, all of which have his personal signature for approval. So I oversaw about 1,200 of those. And, you know, it's important. Like, he cared. He wanted to know who they were, what are their backgrounds, how what's their policy, you know, stance. So, you know, we're glad that he didn't to give us a backseat. But I was just concerned because he was dealing with so much, so much bigger fish to fry. We thought, sure, you know, sure. maybe we'll scale back. But no, he didn't scale back. Yeah. And, and my only glimpse into, you know, that that warmth, as you describe it, uh, for maybe five years ago, um, my wife's company, there was an event, we uh, fundraiser for military families and uh, President Bush was the keynote speaker that evening. And because of her company sponsorship, we had an opportunity to go and get screened and, and go and, and, and have a photo. And um, you know, expect, I expected it to be a very, you know, I'm in a suit and tie as is, his, as is he, and my wife was very formal. I thought it would be a very formal staged moment. Well, we're walking over to him and he didn't know us. And I tell you, his face lights up. He yeah. sticks out a hand with a very enthusiastic, how you doing? And asked a couple of questions and like, it was a very brief moment, but I, I, I got a sense of that. Like, you know, it made, it made, made you feel good that we weren't just one other person strolling through next, take the picture, move on. Like, he was, I, he was I like that, that Mark with everybody. I mm -hmm. saw him work the room one time, um, several times at parties. You just think he was your best friend. He'd get yeah. into your space <laughs> and, you know, where are you from? Tell me about you. He, he was a true Texan. <laughs> you know, when, when, when I explain to some of my East Coast friends, you know, what it means to be Texas, they look at me like, what do you mean? There's something about that true Texan that really gets into your world. And, yeah. and, and President Bush is just a good person, he and Mrs. Bush and the whole family. And so I think, you know, we, we were very blessed to have him uh, represent, you know, our state in, in the world, really. Yeah. So, um, our guest again is Rebecca Contreras, and you know we're hearing about her experiences, of course, uh, in in the White House and otherwise. And you know there are um, all sorts of stories. Uh, the book again is titled "Lost Girl," um, as we've heard about today a little bit. You know, from the hood to the White House to millionaire entrepreneur. Um, I love asking authors kind of the, the question of like, what what was the spark that said, "Yeah, I'm going to do this." I mean, obviously, you you have a lot of stories, but taking on a book is a a major undertaking. Um, what, what, what inspired you to, to get that all in print? So Mark, I've been sharing my story um, for the last 15 years and everywhere I go, I have people say, gosh, you know, I'd like to know the whole story. So I, Lost Girl is a Rebecca in the raw version. And, and I always tell people, get brace yourself for a wild ride of pretty much, you know, cradle to grave. Um, it's not written in a traditional autobiography, but more of, of a journey uh, with some tips at the end of success, you know, tips for my success. But um, I wrote it because, Mark, we are in a time, and especially the last two years, uh, the book came out in October of last year. Mm -hmm. People are, have lost hope. People are hurting. People are fearful. People are, you know, they're not sure. And I really felt it was strong. It was Im impressed upon me. I really need to tell my story because it's a story of tenacity. It's a story of trailblazing. It's a story of hope. It's a story of possibilities. And, you know, as Americans and as, as you know, wh whatever state you live in, we can focus on things that are toxic and negative. But when we do that, we tend to go down and tend to get discouraged. And so my book uh, provides hope, it provides possibilities and opportunities, and it really re-engineers the process in the reader to really think different about life. 
Um, you know, not everything has to be a tragedy. And obviously there are a lot of tragedies happening and now, and there are a lot of tragedies in that book of the abuse that I sustained, but you know, we, we, at the end of the day, we own our future. And I wanted to communicate to the readers that you, you're, you are, are the driver of your own future and there is a way to drive your future forward no matter what you're faced with and so that's why I wrote it to tell the story and um, I, I've been wanting to do it for about 10 years and I'm glad I finally bit the bullet and got it done yeah well I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did too it's going to inspire uh, a lot of people and um, even if it's, it's somebody who reads the book and then uses you know some of the ideas there to reach out to somebody in their life who you know, is struggling and not in a place to 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 pick up and and read the story directly. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of positive benefit, I'm, I'm sure. And and as the feedback, you know, will I'm sure the stories, if they haven't already, will will start flowing to you. Yeah. Well, we we are holding five stars on Amazon, and there's a lot of great feedback. Um, I've already done about eleven events, and I've sold out at every event. The book is doing very well. I would encourage readers to get it off my website um, or Amazon, but. You know, it's just a tool. It's a tool in your toolbox for your life and uh, your journey. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure there are links to all of that in the show notes. And, you know, before we go, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your firm, uh, Avant Garde. LLC. Um, you know, who, who do you serve? What, you know, you give some yeah, maybe specific so, examples of the type of work you do. So we are, um, we are in about five different states. I live here in Texas and I have about eight team members here in my, in my Austin area office. Um, DC, Virginia, Philadelphia, Kansas City, I would say 70% of our teams in the district mm -hmm. um, in that sort of, you know, triangle of Virginia, DC, Maryland, we are exclusively a, um, a government uh, right now government facing first firm. Um, we, we we're on a team for a couple of the private sector organizations, but we do all things, people, HR, workforce, um, we, we, we really pride ourselves. My background is in human capital, which is the workforce planning, recruiting. And so uh, what I did, Mark, was I took my 15 career year career in government and decided to figure out a way to re-engineer myself and make money off my expertise. And, um, and it's, it's worked really well. We have a great team. We're, we're in about 15 different Agencies right now, uh, pretty deep, providing um, uh, you know support across human capital, workforce planning, organizational change, strategy, all the consulting stuff. Um, and I'm excited because this year in 2022, we have a great trajectory for growth. We're going to continue to grow because of the good work our people do, um, because we hire smart people. So if if people are interested in, in serving AG, the, the avant-garde for USA.com website will be up there too. But we're growing and I'm I'm happy to be one in the fastest demographic in Texas, women entrepreneurs. We're the fastest mm -hmm. growing women businesses, small business. And I'm happy to be part of that fabric as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And maybe it's just one other question, um, you know, you're as, as being, you know, the CEO of a minority owned and woman owned consulting firm, um, do, do you face challenges? You know, there, there are certain circles you're working in that are kind of traditionally male dominated, white male dominated, that's changing, but maybe not quickly enough. What, 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 what do you have to say about that? Yeah. So listen, Mark, I've been in that uh, my whole life. I, mm -hmm. I actually, I was on the board of West Point. President Bush asked me to serve on West Point when I left the White House and um, I, you know, I was at treasury where it was all white wall street, you know, white male types. Um, and you know, I don't let that bother me or get me down. I just do my very darndest to do my great work and surround myself with smart people, hire smart and just, you know, deploy an excellent strategy and let my work speak for itself. I, I am the kind of Latina that doesn't wear, um, my minority status on my sleeve. I actually let my work speak for itself and let my leadership lead before my my uh, my culture or my. <laughs> I'm certainly a very proud Latina, but I, I don't let that bother me. I think we've made a lot of progress in America um, as women, um, as Latinas, as minorities, and I'm really proud to be in that demographic. But it's it's really not been a hindrance to keep me down. Sure. Well, thank you for your, your thoughts on that and for sharing your story. I mean, it's an, ins it's in an inspiring tale um, as, um, if that's even the right word, your, your journey, your life. Thank you. Um, bouncing back from, uh, you know, um, some uh, d disadvantages and um, dysfunctions as, as you described. So uh, it's inspiring to hear uh, what, what you've done and what you continue to do. I'll be excited to see. Uh, what, what's ahead of you in, in your career and your life. So 
Um, our, our, our guest again today has been Rebecca Contreras, president and CEO of Avant Garde LLC. The book title again, uh, Lost Girl, From the Hood to the White House to Millionaire Entrepreneur. So I encourage people to get the book and, and get more detail. We've heard the high level um, arc of Rebecca's life. So thank you again for being a guest. Awesome. Thank you, Mark, for having me.